this, uh, this extraordinary <laughs> situation. Whereas I say, I've no doubt that the Inland Revenue have got your <laughs> got <my> photographs <laughs> all around yeah. the wall. You know. yeah. um, but one thing that, that, that interests me is, how do you cope with all this sort of um, hero worship, first of all? You know, all the kids who come in there, see you, and no doubt storm the dressing rooms and all this sort of nonsense. What do you think about that? Uh, well, I've, you know, I've made my own back and you have to live with it, you know, I, I, it gets a bit dangerous when you're on tour and there's like a thousand kids outside the dressing room and you have to sort of get out of the building somewhere or other, but if people come up to the house and are polite and nice, you know, you, you, you have to live with this, you, you do have to sign autographs, you do have to say hello to people, it doesn't really matter what, you know, I've always made the point that no matter what I'm doing, if I'm a pop singer or I'm a, a I'm a singer, etc. So I'm in show business, but it doesn't really make me any apart from anybody else. But this is something that you do have to fight with. You know, you think, God, you, know, you come terribly paranoid, uh, but you have to fight it. And that's think, how you keep saying, is it? No. Mate? Well, you see, things like I don't like to bring them up because I'm always going on about them. But joining a football club uh, where people are like Watford, I'm on, the, you know, I'm a member of Watford Football Club, and they don't treat me any different. They don't ask me for free records, they don't do this and that, but they just treat me as a normal human being, which I, in fact, am. But, and so it sort of brings you down to earth again, because, you know, it's, it's, you can lose touch. You know, America's a very sort of bad place for that, you know. You can yes. get carried away over there, because yes. it's sort of, sort, of, sort of not real over there sometimes. Yeah. Can I, can I um, finally ask you, uh, you're going to stay with us, but, I mean, just, just for this sort Thank of... Thank you, Michael. This <laughs> I always think when I say that, I find I ask you, there's a kind of ejector seat where, you know, the others... <laughs> Don't put that past me, Michael. <laughs> but, I mean, what, what, what about the future? I mean, uh, one of the... the uh, do, do you feel or do you think that you're going to end up a kind of sort of a middle-aged ex-rock star or, or what? God forbid, no. no. Um, I really enjoy what I'm doing now because I, I, I've got a band who... I'm, El I'm Elton John, and, and my band are sort of considered the backup band, but it's never been the case. They've never been a backup band, as far as I'm concerned. And the band that I've got now, uh, I really love, and I love working with them, and I, I hopefully got two or three years left where I can have a good time. As long as you're having a good time, then you're okay, and I am still having a good time. But for God's sake, I don't want to be doing this when I'm 36 or 37, because I think it's really pathetic. <laughs> Uh, there's far, you know, there's much more to do in life than just going around the stages uh, of the world and uh, singing Rocket Man or Crocodile Rock. I think that would really be pathetic. Well, you're going to uh, s uh, sing for us now, play for us now, oh. without without the aid of your. It's band. also going to be pathetic for us. <laughs> without the aid of your band, what is it in fact you're going to uh, play for us? Um, it's called We All Fall in Love Sometimes, which is a song off our Captain Fantastic album, and it's. Uh, it's a song about Bernie Taupin, who writes my lyrics and myself, and the sort of the sort of trials and tribulations that we went through. Elton John. Thank you. There's a piano. subway trains The heavy eyes could hardly hold us Aching legs that often told us It's all worth it We all fall in love sometimes The full moon's bright Something happened It's so strange This feeling Naive notions That were childish Simple tunes That tried to hide it But when it comes We all fall in love Sometimes Did we should we, couldn't we? I'm not sure, cause sometimes we're so blind, struggling through the day, when even your best friend 
wait by the phone hoping it might ring and more often than not being disappointed my next guest is literally swamped with offers he can pick and choose and so he does but even then over the past few years he's made an average of three movies each year at present two new movies are on show the romantic English woman and the man who would be king the star of these movies is my next guest ladies and gentlemen Michael Caine <laughs> Right, my old son. Right then. Right then. The thing, actually, it occurs to me about the two of you is that, you know, as I said in the introduction, you're this sort of superstar bracket, but the one thing you've both got in common is that, and I know this for a fact, is that you're both sort of, you've got roots, you know, you know where you are. Because, I mean, your publicity recently, and I know it happens to be true, it always shows you sort of in the garden with gum boots or cooking roast beef. <laughs> and you're kind of mixed you between Percy Thrower and Fanny Craddock at present. <laughs> <laughs> I'm somewhere between it. Something that occurred to me when I saw it up and you were talking about stars and, and English stars is one of the, two of the requisites, and it seems to be you have to have fair hair and be short sighted, which is what we both have. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, spend, I spend a lot of time in the garden. Basically, because um, I kept eating sort of food that it didn't taste like you. You remember everyone said it didn't taste like it was when you were a boy, and I thought, yeah, well, that's because I've, you know, I've been drinking and tobacco and all that smoke and got older. And um, the one thing I never thought of, of course, is it was filled with chemicals. It wasn't very fresh, and so I, I started my own little garden, and suddenly all those new potatoes and everything tasted exactly like they were when I was a boy. Yeah, which of course wasn't very long ago. No, no, of course. <laughs> But is that, I mean, that's, that's really your, your uh, sheet anchor, isn't it? That home you've got and, and my your home, family. And my the... home and my family um, is, is a tremendous anchor for me. It's is my whole life. I, that, that's, that's what I look for. Yes. 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 Do, do, but do you carry over from, I mean, you came from the East End of London from a sort of uh, council flat. Yes. And now you've got this lovely home by the Thames. Uh, do you carry over any kind of obsessions from your background oh yes many i um we were bombed out i lived in camberwell and we were bombed out and and w they put us in a prefab now prefabs were marvelous because they had a bathroom and, and electric light and everything which i'd never seen um that's true I, I saw electric light in 1947 for the first time we always lived in a place with gas 
you know, gas mantles, you know. Yeah. And I remember going round and um, changing the accumulator for the radio for my father. You know, we should get the accumulator. It's a very young audience. I feel like... <laughs> I feel like Dame Edith Evans sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> Be uh, careful. No, when, um, you're, talking, <laughs> you're talking the woman I love, Michael. Oh, I'm sorry. We're the woman I love in that. Right. Lovely. Now, I, one of my obsessions is, having lived in a prefab so, for so many years, is large rooms. I, I, I like large rooms. I, I don't have very large rooms because I've been waiting for four years to get permission to extend the home that I live in. Oh, you've been having some trouble, haven't you, with the bureaucrats? Yeah, I do have trouble with the bureaucrats. That is one of my talents, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we all have trouble with the bureaucrats, yeah. Yeah, I remember when they finally passed my, um, uh, my, my, my extension, one of the councillors said it was superb, and it is, as a matter of fact. And another one said, well, that may be so, but I think it's a bit gimmicky. And they asked him why, he said, he's got central heating. <laughs> He lived in a cave, did he? I don't know. Well, it, yeah. it was one of those folks who believed to keep the window open at night. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's what my father did. My father always made me keep the window open at night and do some scrap tough and everything. What happened? I got bronchitis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I live in rooms now. There are about a hundred. You could you could grow rubber in the room. <laughs> 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 Do you ever go back to the East End where you were born? Oh, I, actually, I wasn't born in the actual East End. I was born south of the river. And um, I, I go back on my own to look around. But I don't know any of the people there anymore, except my own relations. Because um, when I went off to be an actor, they all said, oh, forget him, you know? Yeah. And so for ten years, I was an unknown actor. And there's nothing worse than being an unknown actor, because being an actor depends entirely on being known. And so... Um, what happened was that I swore when I was an unknown actor that anybody who didn't get in touch with me, I wouldn't get in touch with when I was famous. <laughs> so I wound up not getting in touch with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded like a very close family. It went, my family is very closely knit, yes, <laughs> yeah. very much so. It, it is a very close family. Everybody's a... Uh, uh, I, have, I have one great friend from the old days, actually, from uh, one guy who I met when I was 14 who is still my friend today. As a matter of fact, he's at home now, waiting for, with the rest of my family, for me to come home, because they're holding dinner. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't feel any... in their hands. <laughs> <laughs> you don't feel any nostalgia at all, though, when you go back into those uh, streets where you came from? No, oh, I remember once I went back, and I was walking around the Elephant and Castle, where I come from, and everything's pulled down. Where every... It's very strange, because I don't know what, what's going on, but everywhere I've ever lived has been pulled down. <laughs> I'll have to wear a blast, brass plaque in my hat or something. Uh, and um, I went back, and I was walking around the Elephant and Castle, where they're building this great new Elephant and Castle, and I saw a, a, an elderly man wandering around, and it was Charlie Chaplin, and he was doing exactly the same thing as me, because he was born about four streets away from me. Really? Yeah, and he was wandering around. But I, I never spoke to him. I, but there was, And then I suddenly saw... There was a, in this brand new complex, there was a, a brand new pub, and it was called the Charlie Chaplin. And I went in there, it was full of Irishmen. <laughs> <laughs> and they all got little hats on and canes. <laughs> <laughs> no, only the sign. <laughs> only the sign. They all said, what do you have? What do you have? And I said, well, it's the Charlie Chaplin. You're very happy and settled at present, aren't you? Yeah. You're, you're at a very... Actually, looking at your, your career, it's, uh, the, the cuttings come into three separate categories. There's the, like the early days and the early broken marriage and the struggle. Then there's that lunatic period, the 60s, when mm -hmm. you were the gossip columnist delight mm -hmm. and a bird every week. And then there's the settle period now. It's yes, that's sort right. of like a three-act play, isn't it? Yes. Um, well, I think this last act will last longest. Uh, you do? Yeah, I'm happiest that, uh, in this... Uh, I think I was, I, I was always described as a, a kind of bachelor. I, I always, now I always feel that I was an unmarried man, really. I, I always wanted, if you have a very, um... I don't know why it's got a laugh, actually. I'll say it on the next interview. <laughs> no, I, I always, uh, um, I've always been very, very taken up with family uh, and entities. And I remember when I was a boy, I always read books of, about uh, great families and houses, and there was always the, the, the patriarchal figure. I know you're not supposed to say that. 
the women's lib year is over, isn't it, or something? Yeah, it's so gone. it's not matriarchal. And there was always a kind of, and, uh, um, the godfather kind of figure, uh, which is, I mean, outside of any criminal um, activities, I, I always saw myself as and, and have kind of become um, with, with everyone's problems around, you know. You rule the roost? No, I, I don't see myself as ruling the roost. I, I'm the only one that um, anyone can come to for any help if they get into any problems because I'm the only one with any money in my family. <laughs> something else again you share with Elton you see you sort of uh, you deal yeah. it out do you and but I was watching Elton and neither of us feel that there's any is, is not the question of anyone sponging or anything like no. that mm -hmm. it, it's a kind of uh, a, a realistic sharing with people you care for which I think is terribly important yes. otherwise the money doesn't mean anything I mean what are you gonna buy you know you, uh, you really can't buy I mean, look at the way I'm dressed. You, you think I could have a penny? <laughs> That's a disguise. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's kind of local covering. That's right. But in spite of what you said, of course, about uh, about the ladies and this sort of thing, one assumes that, uh, that the kind of lady figure you like, uh, and indeed the one you married, is one who will be the, the um, wife and mother figure for you and, and look after the home and this sort of thing. Yes. Yes, Shakira, of course, she just done uh, her first acting job hasn't she with you? yeah but she she acted in the picture the man who would be king that i that i, I did uh, but that was purely accidental because another actress fell out and they were looking for an indian princess and my wife is not a princess but she's an indian and she kind of looks like rajah kipling's idea of a princess which is kind of beautiful and things like that uh, I, I suddenly think the princesses yeah no, well, she looks, she looks like a princess anyway. And um, so we said, you do it. And it took me about three days to talk her into it. But she, she doesn't really want to be an actress or a star or anything. But are you glad about that? Would you resist yeah. it? <clears throat> well, um, I suppose I, um, I would slightly, in as much as I don't see any point to it, because if she earns another load of money, sticks me in a whole other tax bracket, and she's going to be going to work for nothing. And, and so there's, there's no point in her leaving where we are and in actual fact my work is all done based on whether i can take the wife and baby with me and so any picture that i that is in a place like with the jungle or something where it would be unhealthy for my baby i don't do it no matter what the part's like really? yeah oh yeah i turn we keep together as a family the whole time it's as i said it's um uh the most important thing to me in my life really true <laughs> Because, in fact, you, uh, you very much enjoyed doing it, didn't you? Yeah, I worked, I worked with a marvellous uh, guy, Sean Connery, who's a, an old mate of mine and a really smashing guy. And it was a very happy experience working with him and Christopher Plummer, who's another friend of mine. I did Hamlet with him many years ago, BBC. I played Horatio to his Hamlet. Uh, and John Houston, who, to my mind, is one of the great legendary directors in mm. the world. And it turned out to be a rather smashing experience to do. Mm. And unlike a lot of films, that are like that, it's a rather smashing experience to see. So I'm rather proud of it. Well, in fact, I've not seen the movie, I must admit, but for the best possible reason, because um, I was not warned off it, but I was told by a friend who'd seen it uh, to take your kids to see it. So yeah. I did, deliberately didn't go myself, because I want to take the family to see it. Well, that's the point, is you, you, can, you can take children to see it, but it is not a children's movie, in as much, uh, um, I think that you see in it, it, it has all different levels. It's, it's from Kipling's short story, if you're a 12 year old boy it's a great adventure story if it's if you, whatever intelligence you have that's as intelligent as it is yes which of course is a good excuse for me because if you don't like it it means you're not very bright <laughs> <laughs> what was it like working with with houston oh marvelous he's he's a really uh, he's a great character he gives very um he, he's a storyteller he told me a story once of his, his um his his uncle this is a sort of story, a very doom-laden man, Houston never laughs, he's, and he's, he's very old and grizzled, he looks like Ernest Hemingway, he always talks like that. And he said, Michael, he said, my uncle was dying. He said, and he was laying in bed in Connecticut, and he had two or three days or two or three weeks to live. He said, and a friend of his, his wife's, a woman came all the way from New York to Connecticut in the snow, two and a half hours to see him. And his wife went upstairs and said, Mrs. Smith has arrived to see you. He says, I won't see her. He said, that woman has bored me for 35 years, and I refuse to see that damn woman on my last two or three days on earth. She said, but you've got to see her. You've got to see her. She's come all this way from New York. So he said, well, I'll tell you what you do. He said, 
I'll pretend to be dead. <laughs> he, said, he said, I'll pretend to be dead, and then you go downstairs and tell her that you came up to say she was here, and I'd passed on. <laughs> so he did, so he laid there like that, dead, and the woman came up and kissed him and said some prayers and burst into tears and left. And then Houston told this story to me, and he said, the moral of this story, Michael, is, he said, that even if you're dying, pretend to be dead rather than be bored. <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice moral. That's, that's Houston, that's, that's absolutely Houston. Yeah. Let's talk to the two of you now, because you are the two um, uh, superstars in this country who have not gone into tax exile abroad. And I wondered if I could ask you both the reason why. Who, you want to start? Uh, you, you've I'll been on the longest. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a simple reason. Uh, I just like living in England. And I think you, have to, you can only earn so much money and you can only buy you so much, as Michael was saying. And you have to find out where your roots are and where your happiness is and where you feel best at home. I mean, I have a house in Los Angeles which I bought because I was spending so much money at the Beverly Hills Hotel I thought it would be cheaper to buy a house. So. I bought a house there, but I live in England. I'm an English resident, and I like living in England. I'm happy there, which is, that's all there is to it, as far as I'm concerned. What about you, Michael? It's the same with me. It's, it's a purely emotional thing. Um, you have to work out the difference between what you would save in taxes living abroad, and, and, and that amounts, for me, emotionally, to how much my happiness is worth. And, of course, my happiness isn't worth, uh, is worth much more than that. Also, you wind up with kind of little practical things. I remember when you get really very homesick when you're you're away for a long time you i remember going in in los angeles going all the way down to hollywood boulevard which cost me like a, a return fare from 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 beverly hills something like four pounds to buy the sunday newspapers um which cost me the sunday newspapers the seven or five that you can get cost me seven pounds and so you wind up spending four pounds in cab fare to pay seven pounds for Sunday newspapers and you're supposed to be out there saving money. <laughs> in, and at the same time, at the same time, you're miserable, you know. What, what are you miserable for, though? Rain. <laughs> the, in Los Angeles, it's always... Uh, I tell you what it is. In Los, Los Angeles is a marvellous place and I love to go there and I love being there. I have a great many very good friends there. But what happens is, is that you, you get this kind of guilt. Like after the winter's been, when kind of nothing happened, the spring comes and nothing happens, it's just 85 every day, you know, and then the summer comes and it's 95 every day, and then the winter comes and it's 75. And life is kind of like that. In England, by the time the first daffodil comes out, you really feel as though you deserved it, because you lived all through the... <laughs> you know what I mean? You go, oh, and he said... People say, isn't God good? You say, isn't God good? What have I been through since last October to get a daffodil? <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, and so, so in the end, what it is, is, is I like the change. The seasons, you even look forward to the winter in a kind of masochistic way. Yeah. You know? I suppose it's football with you, is it, Delton? I mean, that's what you, you miss most of all when you're in America. Uh, and, and also relations and, and friends. Um, yeah, that's the same I, as me. Mm. I, I just miss the same. England to me is sane, you know. Um, I'm, I love America. I'm not, I, lo I like to go to America, as St. Mark, uh, Michael said, and I like to go for six months, but then I got uh, six weeks or s whatever it is, a period of time, but you always know that you're going to leave and go back to England, and that's great. Also, there's a point, as, as far as career goes, if you're always seen out uh, at the Sunset Boulevard in the shopping market and you said, Everyone can go in there and say, oh, I saw Elton John down the market today. It's sort of a mystique living in England. Americans are fascinated with English people. And I, I think it's a good thing to live in England from a career standpoint of view because they, you know, they like people that come from England and they ask you questions like, do you have refrigerators in England? Uh, which is, I swear to God that's true. You know. Oh, you have refrigerators? Far out. You know, yeah. I uh, think, though, about, uh, about these extraordinary amounts of money that both of you earn. I mean, do you think uh, that you're worth it? Uh, yeah, I think you're worth whatever you can get. <laughs> we're, we're paid for very short periods of our lives. A, a, a working career of a, a creative person is... Um... Oh, I'm not going to tell you a load of stories about what... <laughs> <laughs> I think um, we're worth what we can uh, not get, what we can keep. <laughs> 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 Which is a, a very different amount. 
yeah. a very different amount. Right. But I, I do think that if you... What, what people pay us for is the gamble we took. I remember when I left school, everybody went into a regular job and they knew they were going to get a damn good living all their lives. Whereas I could have been penniless my entire life. And I was paid on a gamble. Mm. And the people who don't gamble don't expect to win big prizes, do they? Do you see what I mean? I do. Elton, right. what about you? Uh, I think people have got the wrong idea of me. I think they've only got to shake my hand and they think I'm going to give them a Rolls Royce Corniche. Uh, I really don't, I've no idea how much money I've actually got, I've literally no, because I'm not really interested, you know. I'm enjoying what I do, I'm very, very grateful for being paid the amount of money, uh, the vast amount of money that I, I'm paid for what I do. But, you know, as I say, I don't force people, I don't sort of stand with a whip and force people to go in record shops and buy my records. I mean, I could be release a record tomorrow, and I probably will do, that will just plummet down the charts, you know. Um, in fact, I've got a single out now that isn't doing too well. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you take it's a gamble, as Michael said. But that's the excitement of it all. Um, I don't. I'm not. Um, oh God, what's the word? I'm not uh, sorry about the money I've got because. Uh, you don't feel the shame of it. No, not at all. No. I've worked. Mm -hmm. I've worked for like eleven or twelve years to get where I am. Mm. Uh, but you know, I. I think the thing with money is to enjoy it and not to hoard it and not to be miserable. So many people are so miserable with success and they sit on their money and they, they never spend anything. You go to the pub and the moths fly out the pocket, you know. Uh, I really think that tomorrow it could all end I could be knocked over by a London transport bus. And I've had a bloody good time with what I've had and that's the whole point. That is the point, yes. The other, the other end of the scale is what I'm thinking of as far as the gamble is you think of the unknown actor who tried to make it and didn't. All his family, every time he meets his family, they say, and there are you bum, I told you to get a regular job. <laughs> you see what happens, you see, I told you, you, you couldn't talk properly, you didn't do four eyed get, why didn't you get something? <laughs> this, what, this is what happens, because I've been both those things. Well. I've been the unsuccessful actor as well, when people say, well, what, you should have gone in the market with your father. <laughs> Billy's get market, my father worked in. Have you seen what happened to Billy's get market? <laughs> Frozen fish, they don't bring it in anymore. <laughs> Closing the thing down. Who'd have thought fish would go off the menu? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, we're going to take you right back, both of you, to, uh, to your roots. Because, in fact, as I mentioned, uh, Elton, you started off as a pub pianist. Yeah. We've got a pub piano over there. We've also got a couple of pints. There's only two up there. That's for you and me, Mike. Yeah, we're the, about, the player can't drink. No, 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 no the player we can't. Pour it over him. That's right, if it's no good. Because there's no window there. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. There's no window. Let's go across and have a, have a, a sing song. Right. My word. My word. Oh, it's lovely. I feel like Winifred Atwell with this. It's my other piano, all right? <laughs> John, you haven't seen before. And unless... one you'll probably never see again. <laughs> we got a request. What? A request? Maybe. What? Well, yeah. Maybe it's because I'm a Londoner. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You yeah. wrote that. That it was an actor wrote that. Oh, uh, George Gershwin. Laurie <laughs> <laughs> Gershwin. Gershwin. <laughs> right. You all know it, don't you? Yes. Right. So right. Right, let's hear you this time, okay? Yeah, come on, come on, Mr. Come on. Piano player. All right. Sorry about this. <laughs> sweet, sweet. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs>
that's uh, that's it uh, for this week. I'd like to thank. Oh, God, uh, I've <laughs> <laughs> been smashing. I've really enjoyed it. I'd like to thank uh, you, Elton John, and you, Mike Kane. Uh, before we go, of course, I can't let Mike Kane get away with that, and uh, we'd like to close traditionally with the national anthem, which is <laughs> on Il Climo Bartat. <laughs> Do you know the, uh... Know it. The know words? it. He wrote it. He wrote it. You should sing with a club outing. Oh, the club outing, yeah. But, but I'm not...